The Gateway brings you the day's news each weekday from around the St. Louis region and the state capitals in Jefferson City. Our schools are accredited. We don't need this bill. And Springfield. How many more years must pass before lawmakers see time is of the essence? I'm Abby Larico. Join me each weekday for The Gateway on the STLPR app or wherever you get podcasts. The coronavirus has affected St. Louis County more than any other place in Missouri. So it's no surprise COVID-19 has dominated the policy discussion in Missouri's largest county. But not everybody agrees with the policy direction set by St. Louis County Executive Sam Page and the democratically controlled county council. St. Louis County Councilman Ernie Trakus joins us next on Politically Speaking to talk about why he disagrees with the Democratic majority and where he thinks county politics goes from here. Let's hit the music. This is the Politically Speaking podcast, the definitive show about Missouri politics. It's a little complicated in Bolivar because there is a Parsons family there. But we also knew that it was important to make sure that that we got to where we needed to go. You know if you walk in a room and you're getting ready to make a decision and everybody in the room looks like you, you need to stop. And right now what happens in the United States Senate is as critical as anywhere else in the country. I really want the state to succeed. We want everybody to uh, know that we're all working together. I just worked hard to try to build my name where I didn't have the money. And welcome to Politically Speaking. I'm your host, St. Louis Public Radio political correspondent Jason Rosenbaum. Joining me over the phone today is the St. Louis County Councilman from the 6th District. Our special guest today is... Ernie Trakis. Thank you very much, Councilman Trakis, for for joining me today. And before we start talking about the divisions on the county council, the stay-at-home order, and kind of the upcoming elections, just remind our listeners what the 6th District entails. Yeah, well, first, let me thank you for having me on the show, Jason. It's always good to talk with you, and I'm glad to be here. 6th District is essentially the the bulk of South County, um, stretching from the River to Pear all the way south to the Merrimack River, um, on the east, bordered by the Mississippi, and all the way west to basically Sunset Hills, for all intents and purposes. I would say that being the 6th District Councilman is one of the most difficult jobs in all of St. Louis regional government, because not only do you have to vote on global county issues, but you're also seen as the convener, mediator, decider for a lot of zoning issues in unincorporated St. Louis, South St. Louis yeah, County. A- a- absolutely. As you know, I mean, I've got almost no um, municipalities in District 6. There's four small ones. The vast majority of residents in District 6 live in unincorporated St. Louis County. And so, and they only have one elected representative. So it's a daunting task at times, but so you're right about that. And and zoning is a huge issue. That's why uh, um, I support Councilman Fitch's legislation to um, change the complexion of the zoning planning and zoning commission so that all members must reside in, in unincorporated portions of St. Louis County. Yes, it's a lot of work, and you definitely deserve $20,001 for your toilet <laughs> oil instead of 20000 But let's talk Let's talk about what's been going on in St. Louis County Council politics right now. I think sure. anybody who's been following it, either passively or very closely, has seen a marked division now between the three Republicans on the council and the four Democrats on the council. And I, I want you to explain in your own words, why is there this really stark division that we're seeing right now? Reduced to its essence, Jason, it it has to do with chemistry. Now, if you look at from the beginning of 2017 through probably um, certainly um, 18, if not a good portion of 19, uh, there was a chemistry on the council, uh, part of it born from uh, a common cause, which was to make sure that county government was operating uh, openly, transparently, and correctly. And so um, when County Executive Page was chairman, um, he certainly reached out across party lines. I certainly did the same. And we initially started with uh, a um, working group of four, myself, um, Chairman Page, Councilwoman Irby, and Councilwoman um, Walton Gray. And with that um, nucleus, we began to uh, take serious the job of looking hard at what the county executive at the time was trying to uh, push through the council. And over time, and with a lot of effort, um, we obtained, I think, a, a, an exemplary result in terms of making county government uh, 
more open, transparent, and accountable to um, the residents of St. Louis County. But that chemistry no longer exists on the council for a whole host of reasons, not the least of which we no longer have a common opponent in the county executive um, or anyone else for that matter. So the, um, the, the chemistry for bonding and, and putting aside partisanship, putting aside ideology um, in the hopes of finding common ground isn't quite as um, predominant now as it was between the beginning of 2017 and for all intents and purposes, half of 2019. Well, I want to actually play a clip from you from the night that the council chose then Chairman Page to be County Executive Page. And this is what you had to say about why you felt Page was the the best person for the job. I don't think there could have been a better choice for this time right now in the next 18 months. We needed someone who understood the issues, the problems, and the players that we've dealt with for the last two years. Chairman Page has demonstrated incredible leadership during that two-year period in making sure that we stayed focused on accountable and transparent government. So as that clip suggests, and as you just said, you and County Executive Page were very close up and up until maybe a few months ago, at least on certain like philosophical and, and policy grounds. So the, the big question is, what happened? Well, I think part of it, Jason, is you have to understand um, different roles. He's now county executive um, as opposed to chairman of the council. And the county executive, um, by the the charter itself, one of my big complaints about the charter, in my opinion, regardless of who the county executive is, it vests way too much power in that person. Nonetheless, Sam Page is there now. He's county executive, has a different set of uh, dynamics that he works with. Um, and he's made efforts, and this should, is, should no way be interpreted as an overall criticism of Sam Page, but it, it's a different dynamic now. And my job as a councilman for District 6 is to um, represent my constituents and the residents of the county as a whole um, as, as a separate but equal legislative body um, that is designed to the extent that's capable of keeping the county executive in check and balance. And that's what we've tried to do. In those efforts, we have disagreed on certain things. There's no getting around that. Um, And that's, I think, part and parcel of each person doing their job. And I'm going to kind of put myself in the position of the four Democrats on the council. They may look at broader election results over the last couple of years, and they may conclude that St. Louis County is a 60-40 Democratic county, and that while there are three Republicans on the council, they are carrying out the mandate of the broader electorate by not only we're not only talking about the coronavirus related stuff, which we're going to talk about in a minute, but other issues where the three Republicans have disagreed with them on. How would you respond to that, that the four Democrats on the council are merely kind of doing the will of the electorate and that that you, Councilman Harder and Councilman Fitch, while you certainly have a a right and a responsibility to speak for for your residents, are, are kind of part of, of, of a vocal minority, so to speak? Well, a, a couple things. One, um, look at, as I said, the period of 2017 and 2018. There, you still had the same complexion of the county in point of fact. Um, prior to my getting there, there were only two, two Republicans on, on the council. But the point is, um, you still had the same complexion in terms of uh, Democrats and Republicans. And yet, there was clear cooperation, communication, and collaboration. So the idea that somehow um, it's not possible with um, one party having a majority, I don't think is is an accurate um, reflection of what has to be. Secondly, um, you know, count, county politics is not the same as state or national politics. And by that, I mean, um, despite the letter that's behind someone's name, um, it, it really... Um, comes down to uh, trying to work together for the, the common good of the, count, uh, of the county. And so in that sense, it's well, without being such, it is kind of operates somewhat similar to what it would perhaps if we had nonpartisan elections, um, which is we, we've tried to get that on the, on the agenda for a, a, a ballot initiative, and we'll see where that goes. But um, so I think that there's a, a fundamental difference, and it's not quite as hard, at least hasn't been up until now, with these hard, rigid party lines that uh, um, C. 
seem to stand in the way of communication and uh, um, dialogue. So let's talk about one of the issues where these aforementioned divisions became very clear, and that's this decision to allow County Executive Page to have full reign over how to spend $173.5 million of federal coronavirus money. This was a mm-hmm. very controversial decision. It split four to three. And I want you, before I have one of the people that voted for that decision explain their point of view, why do you think that this was not the right move for the county to take? So first off, I want to make clear, this is another great point where I think Sam Page and I disagree. Speaking for myself in particular, but I think also for the other two Republicans, this this had nothing to do, and meaning our position on this, had, had little to nothing to do with election year politics or partisanship. It has everything to do with separation of powers and the the duty, responsibility, and diligence of the legislative body to act as a check and balance on the executive branch. And that's what what the fundamental difference was. I mean, the idea that we're going to simply cede authority over what amounts to one-third of the county's budget is simply not only wrong, it's inconsistent with everything that's going on. Uh, in terms of budget management by the council historically. I'll give you an example. Each year, the county um, receives from the uh, finance director um, a proposed budget for the entire county, broken down by departments, right? Each year, we hold at least a half a dozen, in some years, a dozen separate hearings with the individual departments to come in, justify their request for whatever amount of money they want, and give the council an opportunity to do a deep dive into that request and find out where potential efficiencies can be or where there's um, reason to not grant the entire budget. That, that process is basically, at the end of the day, the primary reason a council exists. And the idea that we would see that simply on the basis of, um, of an emergency, I think is a bridge too far. I proposed, as you know, what I believe was a reasoned uh, compromise. Give the county executive 25% of the money immediately, some $43,000, $43 million, I'm sorry. And then um, the rest of it, the remainder of it, $130 plus million would uh, remain under the control of the council, subject to requests from the executive that we would have an opportunity to hold hearings on if necessary. And we certainly could have convened an emergency basis Um, at any and all occasions necessary to make a quick review and approval. But the idea that the council should cede its authority over that much money um, simply violates the oath we took when we were sworn in as councilmen, in my opinion. So I'm going to play a clip now from Councilwoman Rita Days explaining why she has a different perspective than both you Mm -hmm. and the two Republicans that voted against the decision to give County Executive Page power to distribute CARES Act money. At this particular point, we have until December 31st to get this money to the people who need it. And I happen to be in one of those districts, I think Rochelle is one, and maybe way out in West County, I, I, when I'm looking at the map, I'm looking at the darker area uh, of the map where this is absolutely devastating the county. And we need to make sure that, that these folks have relief as soon as we possibly can. So there's no really time for political games, if you will. I, I mean, you... Uh, you aware of, of how I operate. I don't I don't play those games. I know that I'm here to make sure that the people in the first district get what they need. And that's going to be my my method going. Uh, it has always been my method. And so it won't it won't uh, change. So what do you make of the arguments from Councilwoman Days and the other Democrats who have made similar contentions that the coronavirus right now is an emergency, that by doing what you just mentioned and appropriating the money, it could bog the distribution of the money down to the places that really need it? Um, well, to be perfectly frank, I don't make much of that argument. And in no small way, because of what I've already told you, at any point, at any point in the process, whether it's now or December 20th, the council can, can be convened um, within 24 hours upon uh, request by the chairman, if necessary, to consider whatever request the county executive had. So this idea that somehow, if we don't approve at all, where it's going to be dragged out um, through weeks and weeks of approval process, frankly, is a false narrative. 
Um, nothing could have been further from the truth. If it didn't need emergency um, uh, action, fine. But if it did, I and the other two Republicans stood ready at any time to convene within a 24-hour notice to consider whatever the request was. So the idea that somehow our um, opposition, again, based on the idea of checks and balances and separation of power, um, is some way a game is frankly um, almost not worthy of a response, frankly. There's no game here. This is about good governance and the way government is intended to work. It's not just my opinion, but the opinion of two um, PhDs in, in political science who uh, opined on whether or not the county, should, county executive should have exclusive control over $135 million, $173.5 million. And that's in a reference to a St. Louis Post-Dispatch article that I, I believe quoted Ken Warren of St. Louis University and Dave Robertson of cool. UMSL. So I just want to make sure that that is right. known. Before we get to the stay-at-home order, I, I want to bring up something we talked about offline, about uh, the role of Republicans in, in this debate. Because mm -hmm. I have heard the Democrats say, like, there needs to be, like, a united front in an emergency. And I definitely understand the impulse that you don't want to see really stark differences of opinion in, in times like these. But as we talked about, sometimes it's good to have disagreements like this because it presents two strong arguments for the public to decide which one they like better. But I want you to explain kind of the importance of having disagreement, even in times of, of crisis like this. Well, of, of course. I mean, reason, debate, and dialogue on any matter of importance is essential to a democratic form of government. Otherwise, you have uh, despotism and totalitarianism. So the idea that somehow there shouldn't be debate and dialogue um, is counterintuitive to a representative democracy, number one. Number two, uh, I, I think that it's important for both sides to hear opposing views and arguments. We may not agree, but on occasion, we will. Um, or we'll find the common ground whatever that common ground may be. But um, the idea that somehow we'll just um, forego dialogue, forego debate on the auspices of an emergency, and I'm not making light of the coronavirus emergency, far from it. All I'm saying is that we have a responsibility um, to the people to fulfill our oaths as a separate but equal branch of government responsible for checks and balances on the executive branch. And it was remiss, and I will always take that position, it was remiss on the part of the majority to cede that authority to the county executive. And that's before we get to whether or not they even acted in a legal fashion based on the bill that they uh, um, acted on. So that's where I stand on it. And uh, it has nothing to do with partisanship, has nothing to do with election year politics. It has everything to do with the way democratic government in a republic is supposed to operate. We'll be right back after this quick break with Councilman Ernie Trakis. If you have a smart speaker, you have access to the entire world of NPR and St. Louis Public Radio. All the latest news and all the captivating stories. Activate our voices with yours by telling your smart speaker to play St. Louis Public Radio. And we're back on Politically Speaking with St. Louis County Councilman Ernie Trakis. I want to talk about the state of St. Louis County's stay-at-home order, because at the time we're recording the show on Monday, May 11th, County Executive Page has announced that it is going to be easing on May 18th. And it's not going to be completely going away. There are going to be occupancy limits on businesses that are allowed to open. Certain businesses like gyms and entertainment centers are not going to be allowed to open. And as we'll talk about in a few minutes, there there's not really an expansion on the restrictions on of daycares for essential workers, and there's no decisions that have been made on summer camps. Um, I know in particular, Councilman Trakis, you had been particularly concerned about the restrictions on places of worship, which I, yeah. I think I think are affected by this. So before we get to the general stay at home order and, and the state of it, I want you to explain uh, what your your problem was on the pl uh, place of worship issue and whether the changes County Executive Page made alleviate some of those concerns. Well, I guess uh, to start with my, my main concern, and I'll try not to be too wonkish on this, 
uh, I believe then and I believe now that the executive orders as initially issued and imposed on places of worship, mosques, synagogues, churches, temples, um, violate the First Amendment. The, fir the, uh, the, the free exercise clause um, and the freedom of assembly clause of the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. Why is that? Because I'm not making light of the public interest of the coronavirus and the public health issue. But the point is when government acts on a stated public interest, it has to do so in a measured way so that there is no discrimination in terms of how its order is applied. With that in mind, think about the idea that when the orders are issued, hundreds of people are able to go into a Schnucks or a Home Depot or a Sam's at the same time. But at the same moment, a mosque or a church or a synagogue or a temple cannot hold a service for corporate worship um, if it has 10 or more people. That is not um, what I what I would consider to be a sufficiently reasoned application of the executive order as to houses of worship and people of faith, because it discriminates on against them on the basis of that faith. That's constitutionally impermissible, and I believe that uh, um, our lawsuits now been filed against the county, and unless that order is modified, I have no doubt in my mind the federal court in downtown St. Louis will. Uh, find as I've just described. So that's the one problem I have with that, and that's been going on now for over a month. Um, there are ways they could have addressed uh, sufficient protections and allowed churches to operate. So, for instance, within a percentage of their occupancy permit. So if yeah. you had a, a mosque, let's say, that had an uh, occupancy for, permit for 1,000 people, why not allow them to hold services at initially 250 people with adequate spacing? Yeah, and I want to just mention now, like, I'm looking at the revised one, and in spiritual and religious services, it it's included in the 25% if it's under 10,000, and I guess 10% if it's over. So I think that yeah. the, the new order does go in that direction, although I don't know if it's in the direction that you want to its completion, basically. Well, but what, what's, interesting, what's interesting is that very thing came out of the plan for reopening that myself, Councilman Harder, and Councilman Fitch um, met with the county executive about, um, it'll be two weeks ago this Thursday, I believe. Um, we gave him a, a reasoned, well-thought-out, um, well-designed plan. That very uh, analysis or uh, um, computation in terms of appropriate levels for stage one of the opening was in that plan. So I'm grateful that he uh, saw the wisdom of our, uh, our idea. Um, and so, and of course, phase two, you'd have a greater percentage. In phase three, um, perhaps full occupancy or a greater percentage. And then in phase four, um, full occupancy. So there, there were ways that could have been done initially and should have been done initially when these orders were issued to allow that type of um, access to corporate worship for people of faith. The failure to do so discriminated against them on the basis of that faith, and that's constitutionally impermissible. I want to talk about the child care issue, and I'll, and I'll be honest with both you and our listeners. It's because this is an issue that does directly affect me. Uh, my <laughs> older son was scheduled to be going to a summer camp in, in Creve Corps, which is now in flux right now. And my younger son goes to a daycare in the city. So I want to make it clear that, yes, I'm bringing this issue up because it does affect me personally, but I also know it affects thousands of other people, if not tens of thousands of people throughout St. Louis. So I feel like this is a relevant question. The, the revised stay-at-home order does not make changes to the restrictions in place for daycares, which is now only for essential workers that are defined under the other stay-at-home order, and it does not open day camps. So I asked County Executive Page how it was going to work for parents that are going to be called back to physically be at work if they may not have child care lined up. I'm going to play this clip right now. So there is everything about this COVID-19 infection creates an enormous amount of uncertainty. And there are many, many variables that we have to manage and trying to find a path forward. Uh, none of them are um, going to be great, but we think we have a path forward that balances the risk of public health and exposure and transmission. And uh, every, every decision we make is based on high risk or modest risk of transmission of COVID-19 and social distancing measures to limit that. 
Um, you've identified one of our challenges that we're working on, and that is child care, and we're going to provide some guidance on that. But there is no great solution. Um, there will be uh, an okay solution moving forward, but the primary focus that will drive us is our public health measures. How do we limit the spread of COVID-19 virus in our community while we safely start to open up some of these measures? I have a lot of trepidation about sending either of my kids to either a summer camp or daycare. But this is a more global question to people that want mm -hmm. to further open up businesses. How can you honestly expect that process to work if child care is not expanded simultaneously? Won't the entire effort to, quote, reopen St. Louis County fail miserably without it being synced up with each other? Well, certainly, Jason, it won't be as effective. There's no doubt about that. Uh, I suspect there are some uh, folks that will, will manage somehow, some way, either through relatives or whatever, but that isn't the point. The point is, and I'm going to touch on a couple of key things, and, and one is the use of the word uh, uncertainty and then manage risk, both of those in, in the county executive page's statement to you. Um, let's start with uncertainty. Um, that's a great word because that's what it is. And I'm not making light of the seriousness of coronavirus. What, what I'm, the point I'm making is in sources as diverse as the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times, within the last week, both have published articles in essence stating that all of the data, the metrics, and the projections um, are, in essence, no one can say whether or not they're accurate, and as such, then um, they are suspect, right? Perfect example of that is the great um, cacophony we heard about not enough hospital beds, not enough ventilators, neither of which came true. Uh, and so this idea of um, uh, limiting people's ability to return to work is certainly as important an issue as um, quarantining or uh, limiting uh, people's access to whatever it may be. So again, I understand the uh, the challenge, but at the same time, the the data as reported to this point does not legitimately overwhelming support the conclusion that uh, we have to shut down everything and keep it shut down. So I, I don't buy into that. Um, with respect to um, child care, uh, again, there are things that should be addressed in the way of how we, how can we include that in um, our phased reopening of the county. Um, but, but you're right. I mean, the idea that somehow um, a parent that has to go back to work, let's take a single mother, um, she has to go back to work or she's going to lose her job, but she has no daycare to take her child to. Or children to. Now she's got a really tough choice, right? Lose my job, um, or leave my children alone, or try to find some other means. It, there, there's better answers. There are better ways to uh, to address this with um, the proper effort. And so again, I'm not making light of the virus, but what I'm saying is, um, the government, both the county executive and the council, should be working in joint to find a reasoned approach to opening the county um, sooner, not later, and, and the adoption of a, a plan that addresses all phases with an ultimate goal of, of full um, access to all businesses and other uh, types of activities and facilities should be on the table. I'm not saying it has to be set in concrete, but there should be a defined plan that says, on this date, we expect to do this. On this date, we expect to do this. And the absence of that is beyond frustrating. Well, let's talk about where the council goes from here, especially the fact that we are in an election year and the county executive's office is up for election because uh, County Executive Page is completing a, a partially finished term. I'm going to play a mm -hmm. clip now from Councilwoman Kelly Dunaway. I was talking with her about two weeks ago about her expectations, about how things are going to go on the council for the next few few weeks and months. And this is what she had to say. I think it's going to be really ugly, at least until the election is over. And then maybe things will settle down. I just think that, you know, um, 
I think the state of the tone and tenor nationally is really ugly. And I think, you know, going back to what we were talking about earlier before you started recording, but, you know, it just seems that depending on where you get your news, you have a certain worldview about what's going on right now. And in my, what I see is the the right sees this all as a, a bunch of malarkey and the people on the left see this as a real health crisis and we are trying to respond to the health crisis and make sure we're setting ourselves up for an economy that's going to be able to rebound while the other side is so angry at us because we're taking this threat seriously that they don't even see as a threat. So those were strong words from Councilwoman Dunaway. But, you know, people may have listened to your prior statement about the lack of a need for ventilators or hospital beds and could have also said the reason you don't need those things is because of the stay at home orders. So in addition to responding to that point, I also want you to respond to what Councilwoman Dunaway had to say about her not so optimistic view of where the council goes from here. Uh, I don't give it any credibility whatsoever. Um, The simple fact of the matter is. you want to talk about an, an overt um, display of partisanship, just play back her statement. Um, she's not interested in that statement in any type of collaboration, cooperation, or communication. She's already dumped people into ideological buckets. And I can assure you that uh, my record demonstrates that uh, that isn't who I am by any means. All you have to do is look at 2017 and 2018. So the idea that somehow... Um, nothing's going to happen because it's an election year. Again, I've told you earlier, this is my, my position, and I believe my uh, Republican colleagues has little to do with the fact that it's an election year. It has everything to do with um, perspective of how government should operate from a checks and balances and separation of power standpoint. So I think that uh, you got to be careful where, you, uh, where the pot calls the kettle black. No, I want to talk about like what Republicans should do in August because there is a four-way race for county executive. The three main contenders are County Executive Page, St. Louis Assessor Jake Zimmerman, and Mark Montabani, who almost beat Steve Stanger in 2018. And if I'm a Republican and I want to you know, cross over and vote in that primary, I- I'm not sure that my options are-, are particularly easy. Like, I think as we've kind of established on this show that there's a lot of, like, disagreement about the way County Executive Page is handling the coronavirus situation. Mm -hmm. I don't think that County Assessor Zimmerman has a record of appealing to conservatives or Republicans. And even though like Stanger tried to make the case that Montevani was a closet Republican in 2018, I'm not sure a lot of Republicans trust Montevani because he's run as a Democrat now twice and has you know, presented himself as a pretty strong Democrat despite his adversary. So mm-hmm. where does this leave Republicans, not only for voters, but but people on the council, given that it doesn't seem like any of your options are particularly like aligned with what you want, so to speak? Well, I mean, again, what what I want is good, transparent and accountable government. Of the three individuals you've talked about, one person I know has worked for that, and that's Sam Page. Now, I don't agree with him on everything he's done. Certainly, since he's become county executive, we've had our differences. But as I said, having differences and um, uh, is, is part and parcel of the nature of a democratic process. I think, you know, number one, I'm not going to support uh, Republicans crossing over at all. There's something just... Uh, inappropriate about that for me anyway, and and look how it worked out for them the last time they did that. Uh, so uh, I think that what they should do is is examine the two Republicans that are running and make the best choice there. Uh, so, you know, again, for me, crossing over is not something that I would advocate for Republicans. I'm certainly not going to do it, but um, I think if you're going to, then you need to look very carefully at the three individuals who are running and make an informed decision on on who you want. And from my perspective, I think the, um, there's only one that, you know, it has expressed any real concern and done something about uh, accountability, transparency, and uh, getting rid of corruption in county government. And so um, the other two are big, huge question marks. Well, Councilman, thank you so much for coming on the show. And for all of our stories, stlpublicradio.org. Follow me on Twitter at Jay Rosenbaum. 
How could people follow you either on Twitter, Facebook, or just get have a way to get a hold of you if, if they have any concerns uh, for about the county? Well, I have a, a, a website, ErnieTrakis.com. I have a Twitter account, at Ernie Trakis. They can find me on Facebook as well. So I've got all of those uh, um, avenues available. I'm also um, not shy about returning phone calls or emails. So the, my email address at the county is etrakis at stlouisco.com. That's S-T-L-O-U-I-S-C-O.com. And my phone number is 314-615-5442. Um, and like I said, I regularly return phone calls, or my assistant does, and um, we try to reach out to constituents all the time. So I'm looking forward to another four years of uh, bringing uh, transparent, accountable, and uh, um, not corrupt government to St. Louis County. Thank you very much. And until next time, so long.